legendary humorist, radio personality, and actor. The man who wrote and narrated a Christmas story. Now it's celebrating its 15th anniversary, Gene Shepard. I heard that, along with the voice you're about to hear on WOR. Gene, I'm delighted uh, you're with us tonight. Good. Are we on the air? Yes, we are. Oh, boy, that's exciting. Uh, <laughs> is it still exciting to you? I, I, I guess people must ask you all the time, why are you not on radio? Well, because I, I, I actually, I, I hate to tell you this, Alan, I, I outgrew it. After all, <laughs> what you've uh, written and, and been involved with a major movie and... and uh, you're into movies and all that. You don't go back and do radio. Well, yet, you know, you, you took radio. To this day, uh, people agree you took radio to a level that nobody before or since has taken this medium. Well, thank you. Uh, you, you kind of viewed, I guess, you viewed it as a blank slate and, and uh, I guess, wanted to do something nobody else was doing. No, I never thought of other people. <laughs> no, I didn't. I really didn't. I'm being honest with you. Yeah. I, I did it. You know, I'm a performer. You don't... Uh, you know, when the, when a nightclub comic is on stage, he's not thinking of other comics. He, he does it. I, I never thought of the other guys on radio because I never listened to radio. I wasn't a radio fan, so so uh, you know, it's uh, it's always surprises me when people think that I sit around when I'm not on the air. I'm just sitting sitting around listening to radio. Are you are you aware of the great following you still have? The web pages devoted to you, the the legions of fans who to this day uh, long for uh, your work, whether it be radio or some other medium. Are you aware of how popular you still are? <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, it would be hard for me to ignore it. I, I'm constantly avoiding uh, nutty fans who uh, are always trying to get in touch with me and want me to do things, want me to come to their birthday party in Queens, <laughs> uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know that I have a certain uh, a certain following. Me and Jay Leno. Yeah, you and Jay Leno. I understand that you uh, are not that thrilled about what Jay Leno is doing these days. Well, uh, to be honest, no. I, I, uh, it's all part of the general coarsening of our society, culminating in this fiasco in the uh, Oval Room. Uh, we're we're a, we're a strange, sex-obsessed country, and and these days, if you listen to Leno or watch him. The first 15 minutes of every show is devoted to uh, jokes about Monica, cigars, the president's zipper, and it, it just goes on and on. And I think to myself, my God, <laughs> I'll tell you, we may, you know, when, when we talk about the fall of Rome, we make Rome little, <laughs> look a little like Pleasantville, New York. When you uh, did your work on WOR, you appeared at the Limelight in the Village, and you uh, did, uh, of course, a Christmas story. Now, I understand the TNT, by the way, is going to do a 24-hour Christmas story festival. They're going to show it for 24 hours straight on December 24th. That's what uh, I hear. And uh, that, it's got to be good for residuals, perhaps. Residuals? Is there such a thing as residuals? Well, you talk like a guy in the business. Uh, yeah. <laughs> One doesn't discuss residuals uh, with Tom Hanks. Yeah, you know? I, I, maybe. I, I guess they don't. Um, you, you're you I own the movie, yes. I, yeah. if, if, in answer to your question, yes, yeah. I... I'm fat and rich, and and the, and the money keeps rolling in. <laughs> and you, uh, your humor was always timeless. It didn't revolve around what was happening in the Oval Office, or in those days, perhaps the Vietnam War when you were on radio in New York. And and the kind of humor you've done has never been tied to what was front page headlines. Well, there were too many people doing that, and that's always I I've always felt that's always the sign of a cheap jack stand up comic who does uh, Oval Office jokes. Uh, that's the easiest kind of stuff to do. It takes very little talent to get up and, and, uh, and make jokes about uh, Monica's cigar. Do you, do you have strong feelings one way or the other politically about what's going on right now, whether Bill Clinton should stay or leave? Is that, is that something that you... Not really. It, uh, it was inevitable that that kind of stuff would happen. I've known guys like Clinton when I was growing up and, and all the way on through my life. I knew a guy that was so obsessed with women... You couldn't talk to him on the street. A girl would walk by on the other side of Fifth Avenue, and you've lost him. <laughs> he was just staring. And it didn't take good-looking ones either. Uh, do you, 
when you think back about your WOR days, are, are there certain moments that stand out? Are there uh, particular nights or particular uh, stories or particular uh, segments that you think most about or, or reflect most about? No, I don't reflect on my past. I've not. I've never been a guy that that uh, you know was uh, involved in his past. So, no, I don't. Uh, that was one big long gig, and I, I uh, enjoyed it, and I hope the audience enjoyed it. And when when it came time to leave and go ahead and make movies and get out, move up a rung, in other words, I I did it without a without a glance backwards. Well, you know that there will be a lot of people tonight who may want to talk to you and 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 share some memories about that, even though clearly we do move on. And I and I really in reading and re familiarizing myself uh, with all that you've done. Had a great laugh over the I Libertine thing. Oh my did. God, that was very early in my career in New York, and that was an amazing social commentary. Yeah, I thought of it that way. Everybody, everybody around me thought it was a stunt, but I never thought of it as a stunt. I was trying to make a make a, a point about New York uh, Times bestseller lists and and uh, you know the the. The fraudulence of lists and polls and all that sort of thing. What happened was, I guess, you created with your audience a, a, a book that didn't exist and an author that didn't exist, and you had people going into bookstores asking for it. Oh, yeah, by the thousands. And, uh, in fact, it became international. Airline pilots were listening to me while they were flying to Europe, and they'd go into Paris bookstores and ask for I Libertine. By that legendary writer. <laughs> well, and, and then there was a Wall Street Journal story about the whole thing, which I guess blew the cover, right? Yeah, he called me, that reporter. It's, a lot of that stuff is kind of hazy in my memory, but the, uh, re the reporter from the Wall Street Journal who wrote uh, front page, uh, he wrote a kind of uh, column where he wrote what could be called human interest stuff. And he called me and said, do you mind if I blow the gaff? And I said, no, it's about time. And that we we need a good uh, solid uh, uh, credit, you know. It was in the Wall Street Journal. It wasn't in the Daily News. Well, you know, while you say, and granted, we all move on, and and, and I mean, reflecting on the past is not always a healthy thing. Uh, there was a great line by Edward Grossman, who wrote a piece about you for Harper's, and this was, I guess, uh, in was actually it was 1966. And here's what Edward Grossman said at the end of this piece. A very good piece about you called Radio's Noble Savage in Harper's Magazine. I recall that. And Grossman said, very soon when the genetic race has run its course and everyone is born with a portable TV connected to his navel, archaeologists will find these tapes, meaning tapes of your shows, and they will call Shepard's flights of fact and fancy the final good moments of a lost form of communication. Well, I when I when I read that, I, I was uh, very flattered, of course, and uh, I... Uh, Blushingly, I say, yeah, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing wrong with being honest. Um, the uh, when I remember listening to you, the, the thing that strikes me most is how you would you would tell these great stories and you would go off on these tangents. And amazingly, while the last strains of the Strauss theme song that we just played was, and I think this Strauss was the the black sheep of the Strauss family, I think, as you put it, uh, the guy who wrote the theme song that you yeah. used. Uh, as the last strains were playing, somehow you would bring all these disparate pieces together. Well, that was by design, uh, and they, they weren't diversions, you know. That When you say, uh, after all these uh, diversions... Uh, yeah. Well, what I thought at the time were diversions, but obviously were not. No, they were the, they were the meat of the show. Uh, to me, a good storyteller almost always, if he's really a good storyteller, makes it sound like he's hit upon the theme of what he's doing accidentally. So the audience sitting out there saying, gee, well, how did he get to that? Well, he got to that because he planned it weeks in advance. <laughs> yeah, I always got the feeling, listening to you, that this guy's just doing this off the top of his head. He walks in at 5 to 8, he sits down in front of the mic, and he talks for 45. But that nothing, that's nothing like what it was like at all. No, not at all. I, 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 some of the shows that I did uh, that sounded the most casual, I'd work two or three weeks on, you know, to, to, to get exactly what I wanted to get into it. And... Uh, that was really my style. My style was an offhand style, and I suppose in some ways that worked against me because it made it seem to people listening that it was all accidental. And, you know, then you would do the Saturday Night Limelight shows from the Limelight in the Village, and I remember being under the covers, you know, uh, a home on Long Island listening uh, to these shows, 
And what amazed me was, you know, at least on radio you could you could hide a little bit, but in front of in front of a live audience, you you have to have that audience response, so you you just can't go on. Well, Alan, uh, I should tell you a uh, tell you a secret. I started out as a as a stage comic. The Goodman Theater in Chicago, correct? Yeah, and I was never uh, never oriented to radio. Uh, to me, uh, the most natural place for a humorist or a comic. I don't know why they call me a humorist. I don't know what the difference between a humorist and a comic is anyway, but... Uh, well, doesn't one say funny things and one says, one says things funny? Maybe that's a difference. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, I but I, I always uh, worked on stage, and uh, radio was just a sort of an afterthought, you know. I needed something to uh, keep my mind busy, and when uh, this radio sh radio slot was offered, I, I took it just as part of everything I was doing. Because at the time I was doing live stuff, I, I in fact I did four big shows at Carnegie Hall that were sold out. I don't know whether you know about yes, that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And uh, that was my natural medium. Uh, my natural medium was never radio. And uh, where, well, but yet somehow it, it you 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 adapted to this medium in a way that made you clearly legendary in the, in this business. And <laughs> and uh, and you're one of the only people. It seemed, you got fired in the middle of a show, in the middle of the night, didn't you? They 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 pulled, didn't they yank you off the air at W? Well, they came, they wanted you to to play music and stop talking so much at at one point. Oh, that was so early on. That was that was like when I first came to New York, and uh, there was a guy who was a manager of uh, W O R named Bob Leader, and he was a strong-willed tyrant. And uh, he was a classical boss. He even had a bald head. <laughs> Smoked cigars. Probably wore uh, a pinky. Did all the boss things. Had a pinky ring. Yeah, and he, he insisted that I uh, play music. And I said, I said, for God's sakes, Bob, everybody in the business is playing music. They don't need any more music. What they got to hear is a voice once in a while. And uh, he said, well, you're going to play music. You play music tonight or you're going to leave. And so I played no music at all that night. And uh, sure enough, they yanked me. In the middle of the show? Well, it was about, yeah, about, about the middle, okay. Well, it was sometime during the night. They didn't, they didn't let you finish your broadcast, did they? Oh, no, I was delighted. You were delighted? Well, I, I, I knew what, what would happen. I knew that they were going to get a tremendous negative uh, listener response, which they did. In fact, uh, one editorialist uh, in, in New York who was a writer of, for the New York Times at the time, said that, you know, there's a Mr. Leader on WOR, and I think in the future he's going to be known as the only guy, as the guy that fired Shepard. He said, you know, he's going <laughs> he'll, to, he'll be infamous for this act. And uh, anyway, uh, it worked out. They you know, clearly came to their funny. senses. And, and then later on when they called me in, they said, we want you to go back on the air. And I said, look, I'll play records only when I want to use the record as a as a uh, underscoring of what I've just said, or as con uh, or as perhaps uh, mood music. But I'm not going. I'm not a disc jockey, so don't reduce me to that status. And they said, "Fine, fine, get back on the air so I can keep my job." <laughs> yeah. so you saved the man's job after all that, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. We became great friends. And that, that's when you, you, they put you in, I guess, in the 815 slot on WOR. You know, he was on the uh, on the famous, infamous CCNY basketball team, uh, yeah. Bob Leader. Uh, w w and they were involved in some kind of uh, point spread chicanery. And uh, he was famous for that. He was okay. a famous basketballer. Before becoming a network a radio executive. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, now, you have hosted the Shepherd. Now, since those days, Shepherd's Pie for the New Jersey Network. Uh, th then you did uh, uh, the, uh, I think you did something for HBO recently, uh, the History Channel. So you are you are still very active. Oh, yeah. I'm not retired or anything like that. I'm just not doing radio. Yeah. That, you know, radio fans are so involved that's in radio true. that they think when you're not on the radio, right. you're out of the business. They, they forget that there are other things outside of radio. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, in fact, one night uh, I was going on the Carson show, and uh, we were backstage. I was with Carson. He said, look, Shepard, he said, forever they're going to think of you as a radio guy. You better get out of that damn medium. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's right. He says, you know, and then he told me a funny story. He says, you know, here I am. Here he's Johnny Carson, you know, on The yeah. Tonight Show. He says, do you know I still get letters from guys in Nebraska saying, why don't you get back to 
radio here in Nebraska where you belong. Right, they never know that you did something, you went on to other things. Oh, they don't want to admit that it's more important. So you think, do you think radio fans are a little narrow-minded? I think they're narrow in a lot of ways, yes. I don't think many of them uh, get their head out of the sand long enough to see what's going on in the world. What do you, what do you, how do you feel about modern-day talk radio, which has become I very political? I don't listen to radio. It's, I don't know. I, all I know is by second hand, and, and I've always said uh, if radio is the kind of medium that can deify a, a Howard uh, Stern? Uh, Stern, my God, I don't want to be involved in it. We are. Uh, get... You notice there are no solutions to real problems. <laughs> think about that for a minute. Well, let's think New York City's problem right now. Now, when when uh, when the mayor was elected, in fact, every mayor in the last uh, hundred years that I can remember, every time he's elected in New York, he's elected on the premise that we are going to, at long last, have fiscal responsibility in New York. We are going to trim the fat out of the New York taxpayers' uh, budget. Right now, how many times have you heard this? That. That is uh, Gene Shepard from 1975. Uh, Gene Shepard is with us on uh, WEVD. And, uh, uh, Gene, apparently you were once described as a professional scoffer. One clergyman warned his flock and that you had it were a bad influence, especially on children. You're talking about the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peel. Is that right? I'm the only guy that uh, I think was denounced personally by, by Dr. Peel. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make friends, and friends or influence you, apparently. Well, no. Why should it influence me? Do you think I'm going to listen to this guy and then go straight? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, In then... fact, I was trying to give him some lessons how to, on, on how he could get with it. <laughs> Forget uh, it. And then uh, one lady in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, sent you a uh, helicopter's receiver with yeah, a letter. and did. Yeah, I had to repair it. It wasn't working when it when it arrived. <laughs> uh, so she thought that that was your your job in radio to repair. Uh, well, I don't know what she thought. You know, it's hard to know what listeners think. I'm not sure they think. They react. Uh, did you ever get in trouble with sponsors? Uh, like the time they apparently a jingle for Whoopi beer came on, and you came out of that by saying, "Isn't it wonderful to be able to measure your happiness in an empty flip top cans?" <laughs> yeah, I remember that. No, I never got into trouble. In fact, that's why guys came on my show to get uh, to get that. In fact, one time I did a, you know, I did straight commercials for a Miller High Life, and one day I got a call from the agency, and they say, "What's the matter? Don't you like us? You're not having fun with our commercials." <laughs> they wanted that. You know, there yeah. is a myth that listeners that commercial guys get mad when you do things, but actually they consider that a compliment. I remember Lucky Charms. Oh, you remember what? Was it Lucky Charms? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I remember after listening to you talk about Lucky Charms, I had to go and try Lucky Charms. Yeah, and uh, and then there was uh, Riker Schmikers, Double Bikers, Pipkins all agree. That was a spot for a restaurant chain called Riker's. Which is now a prison. Right no, it was a prison then. I think the, the, the <laughs> outfit was named after that. Is that right? Yeah, the guy had gotten, you know, 10 to 20, and he finally got sprung and opened a restaurant. Before we get to our telephones, is the, is the motion picture medium a better medium for, for you to tell your story? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, believe me, uh, that's why, I think that's why... Christmas story is such a classic because it's it's a perfect medium for a storyteller, and uh, I'm a storyteller. Don't forget that. Uh, obviously, uh, nobody can forget or well, wants yeah, to forget then, that. You know, if if you really understand that, you know that uh, that that the movies uh, are is the classic medium for telling a story, a, a great story. And uh, oh yeah, that, uh, I love the medium, and and it's a it's a very satisfying medium. Are you now uh, working on any projects? Or yes, see themselves in fact, on I'm working on a movie right now. They, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I've had all kinds of offers since Christmas Story, and and nothing that I really wanted to do uh, to do. And and uh, finally, uh, these uh, producers, a couple of well-known uh, movie producers, called me. It's it's been several months now, and uh, we're we're uh, we're working on a deal. And I'm yeah, I'm working on a movie. Sure. You did a sequel called My Summer Story. Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> no, that that uh, that's a long story, and uh, I didn't like that movie. And I and I frankly tell you that was a turkey, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. It uh, it was it was miscast, 
I mean, come on, Charles Grodin, for God's sakes. <laughs> he was in that movie. It was 1974, I believe. I don't know. Oh, no, it was no, 1994. 1994. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. I got my uh, decades uh, confused. That's a difference of 20 years there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, time seems to be one of your problems. I guess. It, uh, oh, I got many. Oh, I got plenty of them. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> go to our telephones for the legendary Gene Shepard. Bob K is with us. Bob K is on the line. Bob is one of those people I mentioned to you, Gene, who has a Gene Shepard website on the Internet. Oh. Bob, I saw your site today. It's a terrific website and a great tribute to Gene Shepard. Boy, thank you very much, Alan and hi, Gene. I've never seen it. Well, I, I was the first. You know, I decided a few years ago when this was all happening, I said, uh, what the world needs is a Gene Shepard website. Well, I guess so. Actually, it was just a way that I figured I could trade some radio show tapes, you know, to hook up with some people. <laughs> and it's been an amazing response in a couple of years. I've gotten thousands of letters. Uh, and uh, I, I know what you're saying about uh, about all the various media that you're in, and obviously in movies and all that is great. But just to, just to talk a little about the radio side, uh, the thing that I, I got back from so many people and the little article that I wrote on the page was that thing about when you were a kid growing up and you had the clock radio on your bed and you're going to sleep and you're listening to Shepard. You know, your mother's in the next room hollering, to, you know, turn that nut off. What's going on in there? Mm -hmm. And I've gotten an amazing amount of letters echoing that same sentiment. Guy saying that, wow, I, I, every night I went to sleep, it changed my life. I became a writer. I thought differently about stuff. And, uh, you know, I just thought I'd like to share that with you. Well, I'm delighted, Bob. I, uh, I, uh, I, I never thought of the listeners when I was doing my show. Well, that's why it was so hip. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, wait a minute. Now. Uh, I can hear Alan laughing. Well, no, I'm laughing because oh, no, of your, I, I, your candor you see, is so... I didn't do a radio show in the conventional idea or form. Oh, I, I know that. See, it, how I know that... Like I was hold on, writing hold on. as I was working as a stand-up comic... A stand-up comic doesn't think of the people sitting down there in front of him. He's just doing the show, and they're reacting oh. to it. Yeah, well, I can relate. You really are in trouble sure. if you're thinking of listeners, my Lord. Bob, thank you very much. And, uh, Greg, you want to give the address to your website? Uh, well, it, 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 it's easier so if for you do a search, search engine. If you do a search and type in Gene Shepard, you'll get yeah, the Bob's it, website. Yeah, it'll come up fast. I just got one quick question for, for Gene. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, at what point did it all get beyond the ability to satirize anymore? <laughs> the, you the mean whole at scene what out point did, did all the stuff that I predicted on my show... Well, a lot of that happened, but I mean, as of right now, I mean, it seems like it's almost impossible to satirize because well, uh, it all is already. I guess when Clinton got elected and admitted that he was a draft dodger, <laughs> I never thought I'd love to see that. All right, uh, Bob, thank you very much. Uh, you know, on these on these websites, when people have these conversations about you, and they post uh, letters and they post thoughts, and and uh, uh, there was there was a talk about a panel you did during the Vietnam War. It was a panel discussion on some radio show, and they were trying to get you to give a position, and you really didn't want to give a political position. Do you feel that that would be ant uh, antithetical to your? being a performer to give a, a position on a particular... No, I, well, I'll tell you why I did that. It, it, it wasn't so that I didn't want to give a position. I felt that people uh, place too much importance on the, the uh, opinions of actors and people who are uh, celebrities on current events. Right. They don't know any more about it than you do, often less. Usually, usually, usually. Well, right? Sure, because yeah. uh, if there's anybody more self-involved, it's an actress. Uh, that, you know, the kind that appear on the on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno every <laughs> night, giggling for a half an hour, you, uh, and then you ask them what do they think of uh, the history of the world. <laughs> and uh, you know, come on, uh, come on, that's like asking your cat what he thinks of uh, quantum mechanics. <laughs> They don't know what the heck you're talking. I, I, I was laughing before when you said I never thought about the listener when I was on radio because I, what I, the reason I was chuckling is because in, in you know you work in radio you have these program directors and management you got to always think about the listener and talk to the listener think about the listener's doing and relate to the listener and you're a true artist who really had something to say and radio happened to be the medium that at that time you were using. That's correct. And and I, I, I never thought about listeners because once you do that you're not thinking about what you're doing. Did, was it so? You just did what you did, and it just so happened that people responded to it. Exactly. Had they it not? Like, just... It was like I was in the next room doing my thing.
telling a story, and they were e eavesdropping. And had people not responded in the way they did, you would have had a shorter live radio career, but but you would have gone on to other media. Oh, sure. Maybe I was, uh, you know, after all, I, I was going on to other mediums. You know, uh, I guess a lot of people don't know what I did before I uh, before I went on the radio. Well, we, I know you were at the Goodman Theater back in 1949. Well, yeah, but also I was in, uh, did a lot of stand-up in New York. I played... Uh, uh, the Vanguard and and upstairs at the downstairs and all kinds of uh, things. I was not uh, sitting out there waiting to get a call from WOR. That's like sitting around waiting for a call from a used car lot. <laughs> and uh, you know, I never thought about it. It was just another gig. In fact, in those days, a lot of guys that were uh, well-known performers also did a radio show merely because it was uh, a nice a little. Uh, a little nest egg. Back in those days, you had also Jack O'Brien on WOR, who well, was a Jack column. O'Brien, yeah, that's uh, you know he was he was just a gossip columnist, but and you had Dorothy I'm about people like Mort Saul, uh, people who were uh, you know legitimate performers. They they uh, they did those shows. Uh, Mike Nichols and uh, of of Nichols and May fame, right. and and Bob Newhart had a show in in Chicago on FM. Believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, before he became Bob Newhart of Bob Newhart fame. And, uh, you know, a lot of people did that stuff. Radio is different now. Radio is now for radio guys. Uh, the guys that are on radio now, that's all they can do, generally. That's you know, all they want uh, to do. And you're right. I'm not sure that's always in the best interest of the medium, either. Uh, well, it's, uh, radio is uh, doing very well. Uh, I think it's perfect for the medium. Let's go to uh, Bell in Manhattan on WEVD with Gene Shepard. Hello, Bell. Gene, it's so funny that Reverend Peel should criticize you because your movie, A Christmas Story. Uh, would you speak a little louder? Oh, I'm sorry. I I said that it's so odd that Reverend Reverend Peel should criticize you, who made the greatest Christmas story, the greatest movie on Christmas, and that movie just proved that you should be careful of what you want, because if you think. If, if, if you want, if Santa does bring you that that you wished for, that toy rifle, it will almost shoot your eye out. Yeah, well, in the actual story, he did. He, he <laughs> but, shot himself in the eye. By the way, yeah, I know. It was the greatest movie, I can't tell you. We play it every Christmas. And yeah, it's, is it it's true that a member classic. of your did family you the, uh, was you using the, the uh, character by Farrell and uh, hold, hold on, uh, Bell, Bell, I don't think you heard Gene. He was trying to... Oh, I'm sorry. Ask you. Go, go ahead, Gene. Uh, Gene was mentioning that there's a piece of, about Eugene in TV Guide, I think, a few days ago. Well, it was more than a piece. They wrote about... Uh, about Christmas Story, you know, in fact, they've nominated it as uh, one of the ten best movies ever made with uh, with a Christmas background. We never thought of it. It may interest you to know uh, that when we were making the movie, when I say we, you know, when you make a movie, there's a lot of people involved. And uh, when we were making this movie, it was never, ever thought of as a Christmas movie. Hmm. Because yeah. he just used... Christmas as a way of getting the gun. He wasn't a Christmas freak, the kid. He yeah. didn't sit around and moon about Santa Claus. And in fact, if you remember the movie well, Santa Claus kicked him in the face. <laughs> and, <laughs> which didn't surprise him at all. Bell, uh... Is it, I just wanted to know, Gene, is it true that a member of your family was used as a character by Farrell and Studs Lonigan? Yes, my father. My father was uh, was a kid. Uh, he grew up in that neighborhood with uh, James Farrell, who wrote uh, Studs Lonigan. You're a literate person, I'll tell you. Most of them are sitting out there. Studs, who? Now we have a pretty good audience here, Gina. They think it's a, they think that's some kind of a radio show they missed. Uh, Bell, uh, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, you're, uh, I, I failed to give some of your other credits earlier, and you, you've alluded to these, the other things you've done. You were a part of Leonard Tillman's uh, New Faces. Yes, that's right. Uh, I was on the stage at Broadway. And, uh, uh, yeah, I did New Faces. That was one of the, one of the Ill -ga Ill, uh, let's say, ill-fated uh, <laughs> situations I was in. But uh, it was a lot of fun, and, and uh, yeah, I was in, in New Faces. We, we played... Uh, I remember the night we opened on the coldest night uh, that uh, Toronto saw in its history up to that day. We opened at this gigantic theater, 
uh, that night, and it was so cold that they couldn't keep the theater warm. Huh. And, uh, you know, the audience was sitting out there. Here we are up in Canada to try to be funny and do all these little skits and stuff. And they were sitting out there with earmuffs on. Oh, what a night. You also played a dance instructor in the film The Light Fantastic. Oh, my God. That was a Joseph Levine film. Yes, yep. indeed. That's a, that's a collector's item. And it, it, uh, they were so afraid of getting sued out of their socks. You know, all these dance... The dance uh, studios are very big in those days. Uh, Arthur... What's his name? Arthur Murray. Uh, Arthur Murray and, and Fred Astaire dance studios and all that. They were afraid of getting sued, so they never opened it in America, but it was a big hit in Europe. You also did baseball broadcasts with the Toledo Mud Hens uh, and, yes, Ar and Armed Forces Radio. <laughs> that was in my feckless uh, uh, early days. As a, see, see, I had been an athlete before I even thought of medium. And uh, in 1957, you narrated The Clown by Charles Mingus. I didn't narrate it. I created that. Created it. You don't think that Charlie was literate enough to write that stuff, do you? <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I was a good friend of Charlie Mingus. And uh, I never saw a guy change so much uh, in my life. We we uh, we made that. We were having a lot of fun. We were planning other other uh, projects, other other LPs. That's a great LP, by the way. Is it still available? Oh yeah, it's it's a, it sure it is. And uh, and Charlie, in the middle of all that, all Mingus stuff is available. But in the middle of all that, all of a sudden Mingus suddenly became violently anti-white. And here we were such good friends. We were at each other's house every day and everything else. And all of a sudden, Charlie turned into, into King Kong. You wrote, you wrote a Night People column for the Village Voice. The column was called Night People. And one of, one of the things you would do on your radio show, or I think this was back when you were doing the overnights on WOR, is talk about the Night People versus the Day People. Uh, just like today we talk about liberal versus conservative, back then you created this kind of, I guess it was a... Uh, contratomps between night people and day people, as if those were the two kinds of people in the world. Yeah, that's right. Uh, gee, it's, I'm surprised that you, because, uh, you know, I wasn't on at night very long. That was only a few months. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was while they were waiting for a slot to open up so they could put me on at a more reasonable time. But you, you would talk about the 3 o'clock in the morning, the things, the way people, they thought versus the way the people at 3 o'clock in the afternoon thought, and that was a great... I thought that was a great hook. Yeah, that's for an true. Show. It was, it, and it's it's very valid. It's very true. It's the difference between Democrats and and Republicans. <laughs> uh, we want here again. So uh, Alan roughly Holmes. about three forty five a.m., there would be a yelling sound in my doorway, and it would be my mother, dressed in her chenille bathrobe, with the uh, with the aluminum rheostats in the hair. You know, she says, "Will you get to bed?" Got all that squeaking in here. She always referred to my radio as all that squeaking. So I'd say, oh, come on, Ma. And of course, I'm right. here I am talking to a guy now and then uh, in Honolulu, and she calls it squeaking. She says, you get to bed in five minutes. She says, because I'm not going to be responsible when Ferguson shows up here tomorrow morning at 5.30. You won't get up. That's Gene Shepard. Gene Shepard is with us. And, uh, you know, Gene, for 31 years until a couple of years ago, you would appear at Princeton every spring. And uh, that was a great show. Will you ever do that again? No, uh, I'll tell you why. It uh, it got to the point where I felt that uh, I'd done it. You know, uh, you don't just keep coming back and doing the same thing merely because it's successful. And uh, I just one night I I finished the show and I thought to myself, well, that's it. I've I've done that now. I say that after I did it uh, so long, but I did it because uh, that was a great audience. And that was a wonderful hall at Alexander Hall there. It was just perfect, really gothic and scary, and it had cobwebs in the ceiling and all that. <laughs> and it was just a terrific uh, event. But in spite of market demand, you would not deign to uh, to do that again? You no, you've done... not, uh, you know, there's, some, there's time when you have to start uh, justifying your time. You know, you can't just do things because they're... They're fun, and you did it last year, and you did it the year before that. You, there's a time when you have to say, in other words, there's an old show business, and don't forget, I'm in show business. Uh -huh. uh, there's an old show business axiom that says, always leave them wanting more. And that's exactly the way I feel about that. 
I feel that if you if you keep doing it until one day they don't come, then you've really blown it. Let's go to uh, Joe. Listen, number eighty-three. Hi. Uh, what a treat it is to uh, what a treat it is to hear Gene Shepard. By the way, Gene, we have ninety-nine listeners and we number them. Joe is listener number eighty-three. Go ahead, uh, Joe. Uh, I have a copy of a wonderful book that you edited uh, in the uh, early nineteen sixties called "The America of George Ade, uh, the great Hoosier uh, storyteller of the turn of the century. And I uh, wanted to ask uh, you, Gene. Uh, is the book still in print? And number two, uh, is there a chance that the works of George Aid could show up in some other medium, like the movies you do now or the uh, uh, or uh, an audio book? Are you asking me about George Aid? Yes. No, I have no interest in George Aid. None at all? I, I did that book because I thought it, it, it filled a gap. Most people didn't even know who George Aid was. He just was a three-letter word that showed up in the New York Times crossword puzzle. But he was a but he was a terrific writer, and uh, in the in the foreword to the book, I believe you even said so. Yeah, I, I agree, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to sit around and, and devote my life to George Aid. After all, I'm a performer too. <laughs> well, I don't expect you to devote uh, your life know, to him. Come on, <laughs> I, I did like my to... bit for George Aid. All right, Joe, thank you, Jim Sater on WEBD. Jim is another one of these people who has a Gene Shepherd website and also a very good one. Jim, go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, and uh, good evening, uh, Chef. It's great to hi. talk to you again. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, we've gotten. Uh, in fact, while the show, since the show started, we just passed thirty-seven thousand visits to the website. Since this show started tonight, huh? Uh, that's right. Uh, I just have it up on the computer here, and uh, I just like to say that uh, the uh, as uh, Bob also said, uh, I've gotten thousands of email uh, messages from people uh, all over the place, uh, most of whom started out in the New York area. And uh, I'm very impressed with uh, sort of an eclectic collection of uh, impressions that they've had of you and, wh and what you meant to them uh, back in radio and uh, also in your books. Uh, quite a few people are still looking for a few books, such as Ferrari in the Bedroom, Fistful of Sig Newtons, that uh, I believe are out of print. No, they're not. They're, uh, oh, really? Okay, because I, I was having trouble getting a hold of them. Glad we can oh, destroy that. It uh, was right to Doubleday. <laughs> no, they 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 publish it. And they they can tell you where to get it. Well, we've destroyed that myth. I mean, now we know we can get them. Okay. Well, I have to I have to send a nasty letter to Amazon.com then. <laughs> in that case, um, but uh, also, um, uh, Gene, are you still active in amateur radio? I'm also a ham, and uh, I I can't say that I, I've ever worked you. Uh, I uh, first of all, I only work CW. And I'm sure you don't. Uh, no, very rarely. <laughs> so uh, there's no way to, for us to, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm active. You, you know, a ham is like a, a Catholic. You never stop being one. <laughs> oh, that's true. And I've been a ham since I was a kid. I was 12 when I got my ticket. And you My original are... call was W9 Quebec, Washington, Nevada, W9 QWN. And uh, it was in the Midwest, of course, with that nine uh, prefix there. Oh, very good. And that's uh, that's definitely one of the older calls. Well, sure. I was, uh, I, I'm was. i one of your older citizens. <laughs> and uh, I got that uh, call, and uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, I was on the air from the day I got my license. And I've been, you know, I've been a ham ever since. In fact, my uh, I'm in my office here right now, and, and my license is hanging on the wall. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, it's good to hear from your call. And, and uh, once again, you can do a search for Gene Shepard on the Internet and uh, come up with Jim's uh, website. Thank you very much, Jim. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank Jim, you. you're not you're not on the Internet. Uh, rather, Gene, you're not on the Internet. You, uh, oh. You're not uh, someone who gets online and does the email thing. I've, and... never been, I've never been interested in computers, no. Let us so, go. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, no, I'm not on the Internet. and I, I don't get on there and have go into web chats and all that <laughs> stuff. Is because there's there's an element to, to to that computer thing that is reminiscent of the old CB stuff. These are people with no technical knowledge who bought a computer down at uh, Sears Roebuck, yeah. and they sit there and they talk to each other, and uh, there's a lot of sexual innuendos and all that kind of stuff. I just don't need that. Let's go to a chick in Mamaroneck on WEVD. Hello, chick. Hey, Gene, how you doing? Hey, I'm walking around. You sound great. Uh, it's good to hear you hail and hearty this close to the millennium. <laughs> I've got the uh, TV guide in front of me, by the way. Uh, Christmas Story came out as the number two Christmas movie of all time, just behind It's a Wonderful Life. And, uh, yeah, and by the way, I was told by the editor 
uh, who who did that whole piece, he says, you know, in actuality, uh, Christmas Story is a better movie than It's a Wonderful Life, and and uh, we have a lot more fans for it than that original thing. He says, but you know, he said, putting uh, It's a Wonderful Life as a great movie is a tradition. He said, but this isn't necessarily true. To me, I can't stand watching it. It's so sentimental. And uh, it's uh, it's just not my style of movie. Well, I wanted to ask you. Um, we've had a couple of gentlemen on who run websites. I see a lot of your shows, the WOR 45-minute shows, for sale, for actual cash money on the Internet and other places. How do you feel about that? Uh, I'm flattered. That's all I can say. So it doesn't bother you, the folks are making money off of you? Why should it bother me? I, I, that's what I was asking. All right, uh, Chick. With Gene Shepard, uh, Gene was, uh, I understand they tried to spirit you away from WOR to WNBC at one point when Long John went over there, and you didn't want to go and do that kind of a show. You wanted to keep doing what you were doing. Well, I'm not a, I'm not a telephone answer. See, that was when the, <coughs> excuse me, that's when the uh, telephone shows were getting big. And they wanted me to come over there and sit there and, and, and answer phone calls and all that stuff. And I said, no, I'm a monologist, for heaven's sakes. I don't want to sit there and talk to somebody out in Queens about the trouble he's having with his daughter's drug problem. And, uh, you know, I, I just wasn't, it wasn't my thing. And, and John, was, uh, my friend Long John, a wonderful guy, by the way, uh, he went over there because, uh, you know, John went where the big chance was always. And, and as far as I was concerned, I wasn't interested in going over to NBC to do that show. And, and the day, they were trying to talk me into it. They, they called me up to have lunch one day, and, and the guy that was the manager of the station, he was a program director, actually, uh, called me, and he said, I want to have lunch with you. And so we went to this very elegant uh, Italian restaurant on 49th Street, right across from... Uh, from Radio City there, right across from our, the, the big RCA building. I'm sure it's now a gap. Yeah, you could look, yeah, you could look right out of the window and there you are. You'd see all the, all the suckers going in there to get in line. And, uh, I was sitting there having this elegant lunch with him when all of a sudden there was a big hubbub and a guy came running into this restaurant, which was quiet and very distinguished and all that. And he shouted, Oh my God, the president's been shot. And uh, everybody jumped up and ran out. I, I'm sure they lost their shirt on that day because nobody paid for his lunch. He ran over to, it was, it was all RCA guys there, all NBC types. In fact, John Chancellor was there having lunch at the same time. Wow. And they all ran across the street, and uh, we went down to the street, and everybody was standing around uh, on 49th Street there around this cab that had a radio in it. And uh, we were listening to accounts coming in from Dallas on... Uh, you know, the president's assassination. At that time, everybody thought he was still alive. And uh, we were all standing around, and that was a very memorable day, I can tell you. Did you talk about it that night on your show? No. You didn't deal with it at all? Well, I, I, that's all that they were doing on the air. You see, I always felt that there were enough people doing these things. There's no reason for me to come on and talk about something that everybody's been... Uh, you know, talking about endlessly, and and uh, I I came on, and I I was very respectful. Gene, we got to take a quick break. Would you like? Would you want to come back with us for a few minutes after the news? Sure, I'm in no hurry. All right, great. Well, uh, we will come back then with uh, Gene Shepard, and more of your calls at two one two two four four ten fifty on News Talk ten fifty W E B D. guys are riding along and they're in a carpool. We all know that carpools are, are relevant, right? I'm using a Jersey phrase there. I hate to admit I do know that the word is relevant. However, I don't want to offend my friends on Route 3 who constantly refer to it as relevant. So, no, 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 no. One must speak the language of the people. If one is to speak to the people, right? I don't want no misunderstanding. So, uh... <laughs> Uh, you you would take uh, a few shots of New Jersey every once in a while, Gene. Uh, rumors were you even lived there at one time. Is that 
Is that possible? Only briefly when I couldn't find an apartment that, that I liked in New York. I see. Back when now, you by found... the way, Larry King is an old friend of mine, and and with eight wives, he 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 needs ginseng at the least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew Larry years before he made it. Yeah. And uh, he was working in a little peanut whistle radio station in uh, Miami when I when I got to know him and uh and uh, he, it's amazing. Boy, there's a guy that's the luckiest guy in the industry. Look what's happened to him. Look at the incredible su- look at the incredible success he's had. Oh, that's what I say. That's uh he's very lucky. And uh, there he is, and uh, he's, I've been on his, his big radio, his television and radio show several times. You know, he was uh, the first, they, many people think he was the first person to do a network radio show, but you at one time... Oh, I did one. ...were carried on WNAC in Boston and KFRC in San Francisco. Oh, sure. I did, I did my show was on, on several networks over the years. When you went, yeah, Larry, when... Larry's inter- an interesting guy. I like Larry, and and I've been on his show. I wonder if any of your listeners ever heard me on the Larry King show, the big TV. Uh, I I wonder. They certainly seem to be familiar with many of the other things uh, you've done. Well, uh, uh, you know, the things slip through the cracks. But Larry's a <laughs> funny guy. Um, among your, uh, I thought you were about to tell a Larry King story there. Uh, it's a certain they, rat-like quality. <laughs> this is your friend. This is how you talk about your friend. Well, uh, there are nice rats. <laughs> Come on, uh, you are endearing to people, I'm sure. Um, one of the talents that I, you have that I, I never uh, mentioned in the various credits I've mentioned thus far is, and I may be mispronouncing this, cops spieling. What? Uh, what? Uh, cops spieling. Oh yeah. Am I pronouncing no, okay. that correctly? Uh, Head something. That that is spieling. Yeah, cop spieling. Yeah. What now? What what is that talent? What is that gift? Well, you have to know how to thump your head so that it makes actual music. It sounds a little like a like a crazed xylophone. And uh, yeah, I did that at Carnegie Hall even. Played the head. Playing that is like phrenology. I guess you've got to know a little bit of phrenology to play the head. No, a phrenologist reads the results afterwards. I see. Yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he, he reads bumps on the head. And you do create bumps if you play well. Uh, Gene Shepard is with us. The uh, TNT will have a Christmas story, a 24-hour Christmas story-thon, uh, beginning of, uh, December uh, 24th. And that's based on a collection of stories you uh, did in God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash, uh, which was a terrific uh, collection of stories which was published back in the, uh, the mid-60s. I remember when that came out. Uh, the great attention that book had. Uh, oh, yeah, it was a bestseller. Yep, and and uh, the, A Christmas Story arose out of those stories, correct? No, uh, not really. I, I, I hate to disappoint you. Uh, well, I, I, I guess that I'm wrong. It's, it's when you tell a story, you don't think in terms of, I'm going to take this out of this book. It's a story that you told, and I, I was approached by a guy from uh, MGM who said, I love that story you told uh, at Carnegie Hall, in fact, about uh, the kid waiting in line to see Santa Claus, and uh, I'd like to see if you could turn out a screenplay based on th- that story. I never thought in terms of, being, uh, of, the, of the book, and... Uh, but that story was in the book. Well, yes, it yeah, was yeah, in the book, yeah. but I, I think you, you're missing the point here. Yeah. I hate to tell you, I, okay. I hate people when, when people tell me I've just missed the point. But uh, well, I, I'd like to get the point. I, I hate well, missing all right. points. The, the, this was one of my stories that I had told mm-hmm. in several media, including on stage. In fact, it came out of a nightclub performance. That story. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you know, when I finally wrote it, uh, formally wrote it as a short story, it appeared in Playboy, and uh, you know, it caused a lot of excitement and won several awards and everything. The story, you see. Which was written, by the way, as an anti-war parable. Uh-huh. It was yeah. not written as a Christmas story. In fact, the original title was, uh, let's see, uh, I'm trying to put it in right perspective. The original title was, Red Rider Nails the Cleveland Street Kid. <laughs> that was the name of the story. And uh, it, it, they came to me and they said, we'd love to have you... Uh, uh, write a movie around that story. It's a great story. So I did. And, and, and of course, a lot of people think I took it out of the book. Well, no, not so. Having it called a Christmas story, though, gives it that recurring opportunity, a window of opportunity every year around this time for 
visibility. So that uh, that can't hurt, I would presume. Well, it doesn't hurt, no. Uh, I'm surprised at the, at the amazing popularity that that movie has because uh, MGM didn't really, they never promoted it, they didn't do anything because at the same time they had a movie that they were all really involved in and it really bombed, by the way. It was a movie called Yentl. <laughs> was a, it was a Barbra Streisand Barbra turkey. Yeah. And, uh, and we came out the same day. And, of course, that's all MGM was doing, riding around promoting that damn thing. And uh, all the while, they had this classic on their hands. By the way, I might add that our movie caused a lot of heads to roll at MGM as a result of that. Because they put their money on the wrong movie. Well, uh, missing the point. Uh, they, they, in fact, they weren't even going to release it uh, because they thought that kids wouldn't like it. Of all things, I said, look, I didn't write the damn thing for kids. It's, it's a movie for heaven's sake. <laughs> God, God, there's a lot of stupidity in, in the upper reaches of... Uh, of are, are you telling me that the movie executives are as pig-headed as radio executives? Uh, they're a different type. They, they all think they're artists. And, and clearly never understand what a real artist is. Oh, God, no. I mean, they... they uh, actually, the bottom line is what, what Hollywood's about. And, uh, you know, they keep making the same little love stories with... Uh, with uh, Tom Hanks and uh, who's that girl he's always in the movies with? Meg Ryan? Yeah, she yeah. looks a little bit like a 15-year-old boy in drag. <laughs> and <laughs> They've got a new movie out. You've got mail coming up. Um, let's uh, go back to our telephone for Gene Shepard. Uh, Gene Shepard uh, is uh, thankfully with us. And let's go to uh, Joe in Brooklyn on WEVD. Hello, Joe. Hello, Mr. Shepard. Yes. I remember a show you did back in the early 70s. It was, a, it was a hot summer night, and you told the audience to open their window and put their speaker on yeah. the windowsill, right. face it outward, and turn the volume up as loud as it could, exactly. and you were going to yell out an invective. Uh, that, that, movie, that, that idea was just to shake up the neighbors. But you got me in so much trouble that night, because I actually did it, and my mother came running down the hall, and she, and she stormed into the room, and she started screaming at me, and I was lying on the floor laughing. I couldn't stop laughing. But it was worth it. You got me into a lot of trouble that night. But it was, oh, a, great, that's it was good. a great memory. It was always good for the soul. But what, what did you what did you yell? I forget what, exactly what you said. I said, "Drop that gun, you rat! I've got the drop on you." <laughs> that's right. You move one more time, and you're going to get one between the eyes. And you know what? Ever since then, the crime rate's gone down in New York. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it scared the hell out of everybody in Brooklyn. Yeah, but I'm, I miss your voice. I just wanted to say that I miss your voice on the radio. Well, that's too bad. I miss your ear to the radio there. <laughs> Thank you very much. You must, have had, you must have had entreaties from people to come back on Radio Gene. People must approach you every... So just as they approach you with movie scripts, it must be radio people who come to you and beg you, beseech you to I've do had radio several project. offers, yes, several dozen. But they don't, they don't come up with anything really important. If somebody came up to me and offered me like Marlon Brando once said, an offer that I can't refuse, I don't know, you know. But you mean a wheelbarrow full of money, is that it? They don't. They always tell me how much the listeners... Uh, miss me and all that. And then when I say, well, what's the bottom line, buddy? <laughs> the bottom I mean, are you going to cross my palm with very large silver? So how much would it take? Huh? How much would it take? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, that depends on the goal. Look, if, if, if guys that hit 220 in, in, in the major leagues and are, are utility infielders and they're getting $8 million a year, yeah. God only knows what I'm worth. <laughs> Let's go to Joe and Charlemont. Joe, where's Charlemont? i never heard of Charlemont. Huh? Well, Charlemont is uh, 17 miles west of a town called Greenfield, Massachusetts. Oh, you're in Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. How many Joes can we have? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Say hello to Gene Shepard. Hi, Gene. I'd like to ask you a question about uh, the music that you've played over the years. I believe is it is a uh, Strauss piece. He's asking. Well, about you're, are you talking about my theme? Yes. 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 Music I played. Well, that's a theme song. Yes. And, uh, yes, it's Edward Strauss. Okay. One of the lesser known Strausses. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a. I I played that because it was such a bad piece of mu music that I, <laughs> that I thought it set the tone, you know? It's, I know, it, it's so corny, but it's kind of fun anyway, you know? You know, at the very end. is always fun. <laughs> at, at the very end of that, and I, I heard it again tonight when we played it. Where it goes, uh, There's that, ah. Uh, that's a Gene Shepard sound. It's yeah, like, and is that is that a dub or of a dub or, or why why is there that that sound of your voice at the end of the recorded theme song? Well, that's because I'm a mysterious person, and I thought it sounded right there. 
<laughs> At least you you were on the right key. No, well, of course. I'm... But in other words, it's not, it's not a copy of the it, uh, uh, the clean copy of the song. It's it's of the piece. It's you obviously saying something over that piece. And I was wondering whether that was done on purpose or yes. Why why is that? Because I thought it was interesting. Uh huh. Well, it's, it's like it's, asking it's... Picasso why he did the eye red. And he'd say, <laughs> "Well, because it looked right." <laughs> <laughs> or John Lennon because it rhymed. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. All right, Joe. Thank you very much. We've got a Rich, you, and, Joe. Rich and Queens on WEVD. Hello, Rich. Hello. Hi, Shep. How are you? Yeah, I'm walking around. Wow, great to hear you. Right, now, don't talk to Shep about your kid's drug problem. He doesn't want to take calls like that. No, uh, well, yeah, hey, we're good like that. Okay. Listen, it's, it's back to Christmas story again. I don't know how closely uh, you were involved in the production. I was totally involved. I okay. made the movie. Oh, here's the deal. Here's a question that's been dogging me for years. Uh, when it first came out on video cassette in the uh, mid '80s, I picked up a copy, and it had the elaborate packaging that we don't have nowadays. It had a nice, great big uh, gatefold cover, and uh, they listed the cast of characters. At the very end, we have Flash Gordon and Ming the Merciless in the credits, and I've always wondered: was there a scene shot with these uh, characters? Yeah, the, the, see, the final movies, movies have time constraints, right? Uh, uh, a movie is often uh, cut not because a, a, a scene didn't work, but because you had to worry about the fact that they wanted this movie to come in under 91 minutes. Right. Because uh, the movie ho movie houses demand that. Will these so scenes ever see the light of day? Huh? Will these scenes ever see the light of day? No, it'll never see the light of day because that that was just a. Uh, a a scene that was part of the movie, and then it just, Jesus, boy, you really uh, are getting into some esoteric stuff. No, there was nobody cut it out. I cut it out. Oh, okay. All right. They didn't do it. There is not a they that worked on my movie. Uh-huh. And there's not going to be a re-release with the uncut scenes at some point. No. Oh, God, no. They don't even exist. All right, Rich. We've got a Roland in New Rochelle on WEVD with Gene Shepard. Hello, Roland. Yeah, hi. Uh, Gene, you know, your voice is exactly the same today as it was when I used to listen to you every night there on OR. Well, that shows you what cheap equipment we use. This is a, this <laughs> I mean, is a telephone great. microphone. Uh, <laughs> I listen to you from 10 to 11 there uh, uh, every night. And uh, the thing that was on my mind about that show, I wonder, you sounded as though you were really talking about it, mostly about experiences that you really had. And I was uh, just uh, May I say something about that? Yes. Every good performer should sound like he is like it's real. I've always, I've always worried about comics that get up and do material. The other night I was riding on a train going to Manuel Shell, and and you know that it's material, and you know that he didn't do it. He's just giving you material. Well, I always felt that it, that that it, what made a good performer. What I was an actor. I'm an actor, you know. And I want my stuff to sound real. And so when I tell a story, I tell it in the first person uh, so that it sounds like, and by the way, that's the best way to tell a good story in the first person, that it sounds like it actually happened to me. It didn't. Uh, it's, it's, it's a story I invented, but I put it in first person so it would sound like, uh, you know, uh, a, a narrative, like a guy telling this story. And uh, when I did this stuff, to me, it took, took me literally. They thought these things happened to me. I, I always did to this day, and now you're destroying a No, a I, did myth. Not, I didn't. I, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a fiction writer. I'm not sitting there doing a biography or an autobiography. Those are all stories. Well, well I think, like you used to talk about that uh, group of kids, uh, what, Schwartz? I invented those kids. Oh, they they're all invented? They exist. And, and then uh, one story... Stuck there in my were mind no kids where you like that. I didn't know any kids with those names. I invented those kids. You, you said you, uh, the, you and the kids uh, went to a guy's garage and you, you you wanted to make a loud noise to make him come out to see what was going on, and uh, things got a little out of hand. And uh, I don't know. Do you remember that story? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> right. it's your story, so I don't want to be telling it. No. All right, Roland. Uh, right. See, you, you probably didn't listen to me every night. Well, I listened to But I did the show every night, and I did thousands of stories, and I don't remember a specific story often. But, but none of them at all really were 
No, they were not. I, wow. I know you're going to be very disappointed. It was no, I, I, ladies I, I, and gentlemen, a myth is shattered you're, here tonight. No, you're a three <laughs> uh, That makes you just a super talented person that you could create all that well, that's illusion. What I did. But you know, it's Terrific. not. It's not just the creating of it. You it, thought it, I was just sitting around reminiscing, <laughs> right? Well, that's, you made it sound that way. Like well, you yeah, about but, I mean, what you did my with God, you team. should have realized that I'm a performer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Roland, thank Eddie, you very much. You know, you know, Bill Cosby used to tell stories about kids. And, uh, you know, he didn't know a fat Albert. He invented that character. <laughs> thank you, Roland. In the middle of the town. And during that period, they used to have uh, picnics, you know, various events. Various groups would, would rent the park and have a picnic during, during the uh, summertime. And I, I can remember seeing the Ku Klux Klan having picnics out there. <laughs> and they'd be walking around in their robes and eating hot dogs and playing softball and all that stuff. And it always stuck with me. And I told that story, yeah. Okay. So, so there is some factual basis. Oh, uh, sure. I mean, you can't write out of a total vacuum. Yeah. So you're trying to make me say that I, uh, this is all a bunch of series of reminiscences, and I'm yeah. trying to disabuse you of that. No, I, I, obviously, but I mean, you know that a lot of people, I guess, for years, perhaps, because you're, and that's part of the talent that you have is selling it as though it really did happen. And maybe part of us want to believe that all that happened. Well, that's true, and I'm sure there are people that believe that, that, uh, that the captain and Moby Dick really did get beaten by that whale. Let's go to uh, Tim in Manhattan on WEVD with Gene Shepard. Hi, uh, Gene. It's a uh, real thrill to hear your voice again. Who is this? This is Tim in Manhattan. All right, Tim. Hi. And uh, uh, just a couple of comments. So one of the uh, things that I found most fascinating in the years of listening to you were the travel stories you used to tell when you'd come back from a trip. And I think if I memory serves it, sometimes you even recorded on on these locations, like in the Caribbean and um, and in Nigeria. Yeah, and uh, the Amazon. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, well, I'm glad you like that. Or, Nobody ever, ever, ever. You're the first person that's ever commented on. Is that right? And uh, I was always, uh, you know, I enjoyed doing it, and I thought, well, you know, why not? Uh, I'm in India, and I did a thing, you know, I did shows over there for uh, for the listeners and let them know what India was really like. Yeah, they were fascinating shows. And one bit of esoterica, since you mentioned uh, Studs Lonigan, let me ask you, there was a rumor that you were a character or, in, or inspired a character in Kerouac's On the Road. Is yes, that that's true. true. I was uh I knew him and uh at the time and he was he was writing on the road as a matter of fact and and I was the guy in the book if you recall on the road that they used to ride along and listen to on the radio I was the angel-headed hippie he <laughs> called me uh-huh and uh yeah that's that's right I I was I'm in uh in that uh that work and uh now there's I'm a piece of, of it. there's a piece of shepherd esoterico that uh is great to know uh, tim thank you we, we have a guy we have a guy a willie and weehawken willie you say you were at a gene shepherd show at carnegie hall yeah i hit your uh second show where you're supposed to would you now. talk up a little uh, willie yeah. if you can willie please speak hi. up so gene can hear you hi shep yeah hi yeah i saw your second show in carnegie hall where you're supposed to be hitting out softballs and stuff and i remember a great story you told it was the one uh, when you went back in time and you were watching your mother and she was out on a date and you find out it wasn't your father. You remember that? Yeah, I remember that story. Yeah. What a great story that was! And there you are. Totally going, fiction. My mother would have, have never do a thing like that. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. <laughs> no, you, please don't. You're there pleading with her and she can't hear you. <laughs> Is, was that ever written into a book, Gene? No. 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 I, a lot of my material was just material, you know, that I did. In, in clubs and uh, Carnegie Hall. So, boy, that was a crowd that night, wasn't it? Well, wonderful show. The Dancing Bear came out. The Bear Missed the Train. Yeah. Now, that was... Uh, the Bear Missed the Train was that, that old Andrew Sisters song, right? That you... Well, you, actually, it's an old Jewish piece of music. Yeah. Mir Bist Yeah. Uh -huh. The Andrew uh -huh. Sisters, I guess, popularized it for a for yeah. a uh, broader audience. Right. And, and you always refer to it as the Bear Missed the Train. Yeah, now he's uh, yeah the bear the bear missed the train and now he's walking. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Willie. Thank you, uh, Willie. Uh, 
so we, you are now working on another movie opportunity, which would have us uh, once again see your work on the silver screen, which is exciting. Yeah, well, uh, when, I hope so. When when might we uh, be able to know oh, more about it? Oh, it'll be a, a year or two. I don't know. You know, you never know. You can't just say it'll be out April fifteenth, nineteen ninety eight, or whatever. It it it's we're in the very early stages of it, and I've been compiling notes and doing an outline of a script and you know that kind of stuff. You know, making a, a major movie, and, and after all, Christmas Story, you know the, how long it took us to do Christmas Story? Roughly ten years. Really? Uh, yeah. You don't just sit down and knock it out and then go out and, and start shooting it. So you're not you're not doing Neil Simon. You're not banging stuff out. <laughs> oh, well, I'm a different type of Neil Simon, yeah. <laughs> That's obvious. Uh, Doug has a question in South River. Doug on WVD. Hello, Doug. Hello, Alan, and hello, Gene. Yeah, hi. Oh, it's a real pleasure to to speak with you. I met you years ago as a little kid. I had you autograph my copy of In God We Trust All Other Play, Pay, Pay, Pay Cash. I am, still have it? I am a, oh yes, I am a true double B-flat blower, just as you were. Oh? Yes. Uh, I really enjoyed the series of programs you did on uh, the Duchy of New Amsterdam. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, that was when New York was... Uh, uh, growing the beautiful people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all the people like Leonard Bernstein and Norman Mailer were having, uh, parties for the uh, Black Panthers and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, Stokely Carmichael was a friend of mine and he'd go and rip them off and he just passed on, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have, what is the name of your theme song? Oh, uh, why do people always ask that? Because we don't know. Well, why do you have to know? Isn't it better to have a little mystery in your life? <laughs> uh, if I told you it was the Dutch happy birthday song, would it make you feel better? <laughs> well, if I was looking to purchase the piece of music to learn to play it, you won't. You can't uh, learn to play it. That's a that's a piece of that's a that's a, a a piece of music that was written by a notably unsuccessful Strauss. <laughs> yeah, he was, and 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 it's called it, it's called fast track. Okay. So you can go ahead and try and play it on your tuba, and uh, God help your neighbors. All right, Doug. Excelsior. All right, Doug. What's uh, that? Excelsior. Oh, Excelsior! You fathead. <laughs> By the way, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. Uh, Gina, I, I'm just thrilled you spent this much time with us tonight. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I feel you don't. You don't often accept these invitations and come out a lot, so uh, I just want to thank you so much for uh, giving our audience a treat here this evening. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, Alan. I hope I haven't bored anybody. No, I, I, I highly doubt that, given by the volume of our phone calls. Uh, I, I guess to, to re reiterate that thing about Princeton, uh, you said you will not be at Princeton. Will there be any opportunity for your uh, New York area fans to see you in the live concert? No, I'm not. I'm not doing uh, much live stuff these days because I'm trying to husband uh, my strength and I'm working on a movie. And, and uh, you know, when you do one of these shows, it takes a lot of preparation and a lot of work for very little return, I might add, you know, uh, to be perfectly crass about it. Uh -huh. And I enjoyed doing it, and I did it. That's it. I don't want to do it again. Well, uh, I know many people can't wait to your next uh, movie, and uh, will there be more books? No, this is not the age of books anymore. People don't read, uh, as you know. Very few people actually own books and read them. <laughs> and, uh, again, the book is a, is a big project, at least the way I do one. So I'm not going to do a book. I'm going to do, if anything, I'll do a movie. And, of course, uh, a Christmas story for 24 hours beginning December 24th on TNT. Gene, thank you so much for being with us. Tonight. Yeah, thank you, Alan. It's been a pleasure. We ought to do it again. I hope we can. All right. Thank you. We'll be right back with your phone calls. Two one.